Good evening and welcome to the Scranton School Board Director Candidates Forum. This forum is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Lackawanna County in collaboration with the Center for Ethics and Excellence in Public Service at the University of Scranton. My name is Jean Harris. I am a long-term member of the League of Women Voters of Lackawanna County and also co-director for the Center for Ethics and Excellence in Public Service at the University of Scranton. Uh, in addition, I am also the moderator for this evening's forum. The mission of the League of Women Voters uh, is to promote participation by informed citizens in their many governments. The Center for Ethics and Excellence shares this mission. Tonight's forum offers an opportunity for voters to learn about the candidates running for Scranton School Board Director so that you, the voters, can make informed choices in the November 2nd general election. The Scranton School Board consists of nine directors. Four of the nine are being elected this November. In the May primary, many candidates cross-filed running in both the Republican Party primary and the Democratic Party primary. The top four candidates in each party's primary advanced to the general election. When, uh, when the voters in the general election will be uh, selecting four candidates of the five. Um, and the five candidates on the ballot for a four year term on the board, the uh, Scranton School Board include Tom Borthwick, Danielle Chesick, Katie Gilmartin, Ty Holmes, and Sean McAndrew. In addition to selecting four school board directors of these five individuals for four-year terms, voters will also elect a person to a two-year term created by the resignation of a school board member. Katie Gilmartin won both the Democratic primary and the Republican primary for this two-year seat. Therefore, her name is also on the November ballot for this two-year position. If she is elected, to both a four-year position and the two-year position, she will have the option of which of those positions she will accept. And then the school board will appoint someone to fill the unfilled seat. The questions that I will be asking this evening um, were developed by the members of the League of Voters of Lackawanna County. No candidate had any advanced knowledge of the questions to be asked. Candidates, we drew lots to determine who would answer the first question first and Tom Borthwick will be answering the first question first, and then we will rotate alphabetically through um, the candidates for the, next for the other questions. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to answer each question unless informed otherwise. And after all questions are asked, each candidate will be given two minutes to make a closing statement. So with no further ado, we will begin the questions. So the first question again, which Tom will answer first. Um, Tom, you were asking Scranton School District voters to hire you to be part of the district's governance and leadership team. The school board's authority is exercised through the collective decisions made by the entire board. What knowledge, skills, and or abilities do you have that make you more qualified than the other candidates seeking the position of school board director? Thank you for the question and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, first off, I'd like to say that um, everybody who's running is qualified, uh, but I understand that it's a race. So I want to say what I bring to the table here that's a little bit different is that I've been in education for 17 years now. This is my 17th year teaching. And being a teacher gives you a perspective about what needs to be done in the classroom. And one of the things that's been going on in the district, uh, actually, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of things going on in the district. Um, we, we've seen uh, teachers leaving in droves. Uh, we've seen declining enrollment. We've seen kids fleeing to private schools and charter schools. And the thing is, you know, I understand that, that we're in, in recovery. And you think about what that word recovery means. One of the things that, that we're not looking at is the overall long-term impact of recovery. Because when people don't want to work for this district and want to leave, and when kids don't want to learn in this district, then we've got a problem. You know, I have two sons. My son Tom is four and Joe is two. And there, Tom will be entering the Scranton School District next year. And I want to make sure that my sons get a better education than I got. And as a teacher, I have that perspective that I can bring to the table. And so um, I would appreciate anybody who's watching. I appreciate your consideration uh, and your vote on November 2nd. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. The same question to you, Danielle. 
Um, and so what knowledge, skills, and or abilities do you have that make you more qualified than the other candidates seeking the position for school board director? Thank you for the question. Um, I would first like to thank the League of Women Voters for giving me this opportunity tonight. As far as my qualifications, I would have to say that being a parent um, gives me so much experience for this role as a school director. I'm also a native of Scranton and, and a product, product of the Scranton School District. So I feel like I can definitely connect with other parents, the teachers of the district, and also the taxpayers. I'm also a PTA mom, so I, I like to be very much involved in um, you know, my son's school. And as far as what I'm seeing in the district, um, I just really wanna step up to help make a positive change. I currently work in education in the veterinary field. So I, I am familiar with you know, the ed education aspect of it. So I would like to combine that with, with them, just being a parent and having that general knowledge and using that um, to be an effective school board member. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. The question to you, Katie, what knowledge, skills, and or abilities do you have that make you more qualified than the other candidates seeking the position of school board director? Thank you, Jean, and thank you, as everyone has said, to the League of Women Voters for convening this forum this evening. The work you do is invaluable in educating voters. I bring four years of experience in this role. I have served on a variety of committees on the school board. I have served as president now for almost two years. And I've, I've seen a lot of the uh, changes that the district has faced. I always say that I am the only person who didn't know precisely what she was getting into in that the Auditor General's 2017 report wasn't even released when I was elected uh, in the primary in May of 2017. So I have certainly seen this district go through a lot of changes. And I, I think that my, my knowledge and experience in, in watching all of that unfold, researching, learning, talking to the people in the district, people in this community, has, has certainly been an advantage. But I also bring a great deal of experience in the community at large, from the community at large. And of course, I'm a business owner. And I think one of the important things, I always remember someone saying to me on the previous campaign trail, but the school district isn't a bottom line business. Neither is mine. We have, you know, we have a, a mission for service and quality and having a having a good time here and you know it's it's beyond the black and white numbers and I the school district has to operate in that same way too, serve the needs of the students above all else. Thank you Katie. The same question now to you Ty. What knowledge skills and or abilities do you have that make you more qualified than the other candidates seeking the position on the school board? Uh, first and foremost, good evening and thank you for having me. Um, what I believe I bring to the district that is going to be unique from everyone else is over the course of a 25 year career, I served in a variety of positions from an operations officer, training officer, even a contracting officer. I believe all of those different positions afforded me an opportunity to have a lot of different responsibilities and view education from a different perspective. Also in that time, I also served in two military schools where I was both the actual instructor, but also oversaw the actual curriculum, development of our instructors, um, and monitor them to ensure that they were following the Army's curriculum to the T to ensure that we were providing the best education to our military leaders. I'm also the father of a special needs son, so I understand the value of an education, a public education. And speaking for myself, I grew up in Summit, New Jersey, where I had a phenomenal education that was based in not just math, science, reading, and history, but also woodshop, music, art, band, so many different things that afford me the opportunity to make a decision on what path I wanted to follow so that I could be more prepared to make a sound judgment for myself going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. And Sean, the question to you, what knowledge, skills, and or abilities do you have that make you more qualified than the other candidates seeking the position of Scranton School Board Director? Sure, thanks. I first wanna thank the League of Women Voters to have, for having us and good luck to all the fellow candidates on November 2nd. 
Um, first, I would say my experience. I've been on the board for two, almost two years now. You know, I went for the appointment. I got involved when I knew exactly what was going on with our district, and it was tough times. We had the auditor general here. We had asbestos going on. So I knew what I was getting into, and I wanted to step up for my community and get involved when times were tough. Uh, my education, you know, where you have a lot of, you know, difficulties, and we have a lot of tr tough times with our um, financial background, um, our financial struggles. Um, I, I have a degree in business marketing and management, and I also ha have a um, business certificate in public budgeting and uh, finance. So I think that will definitely help with our budget problems. And I think my time on the board and what I've done when, since I've been on the board, I believe I stepped up as a leader. I've been a listener for our, our students, um, our, our, our parents and our teachers. Um, anytime anybody has you know, emailed me or contact, contacted me, I followed up with a phone call. I've lended that ear to listen to their concerns and um, been there for them and to follow up with them. So I think all three of those points have given me the experience um, and the qualifications to um, hopefully earn your vote for uh, uh, re-election in November 2nd. So thank you. Thank you. The second question, I have a little bit of a, a preliminary statement that'll be followed by a question. So bear with me here. Scranton school teachers have been working without a contract for five years. The starting annual salary for a teacher remains at the level it was five years ago, $38,377. This is the lowest starting teacher salary in Lackawanna County. In addition, the teachers have not received salary increases for those five years. The Scranton School District's recovery plan approved in August of 2019 requires any salary increases to be funded from savings found within a negotiated contract. The plan also states that if and here's a quote, if the district does not want to use the collective bargaining process with its employees to seek savings from salaries or benefits, the district could seek exceptions to the annual Act One index limit on raising property taxes. So the question is, in that context, what is your plan to move the negotiations for a new teacher contract forward? And we'll start with Danielle. Thank you. So. As far as my plan goes, I don't think we could be without a plan because look what's happening to the district. So I think we need to really look at where we are spending money and where we could cut costs. For example, we have had a few um, salary adjustments recently. Um, the teachers have been at a salary freeze for the, the last five years, yet we are creating new positions in the district um, I think we ordered new textbooks that are just sitting because they don't have anybody to distribute them. So I think there are many little things that we can do to try to retain our teachers. Um, otherwise, we need to really look at what's going to happen. If we don't have teachers, how are we going to function as a district? We keep talking about we need to follow the recovery plan. Yes, but what's the, what will the district look like? after the recovery plan is over? Will we have teachers? Are we gonna have buildings? So I think this is something we need to work on right now. Um, going without a contract is not acceptable. Um, we're not gonna be able to open our doors to students if we don't have teachers. So I think this needs to be a priority and each section of the district, um, each body needs to just work together to come up with an agreement. And like I said, look at those areas where we can cut costs and really focus it where it needs to be just to help the students. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Katie, the same question to you. So what is your plan to move the negotiations for a new teacher contract forward? Well, Jean, if I had a good answer to that question, it wouldn't be on your list. I, we are, this has been a very, very challenging situation. And to hear the, the rundown you've offered tonight, it is, it is a dire situation. And we certainly don't want to see people stuck in a, in a position such as they are four or five years. But I, I also wish that our members, that the uh, large swath of teachers had the opportunity to assess the proposals that are on the table and really make a decision, weigh in on it. You know, we might be able to, to move forward in a, in a better fashion. You are absolutely right. The starting salary is too low. 
but that is a complex piece of negotiations and adjusting the salary scale to change that. And, you know, I, I, as much as I don't want to pin this on any individual person, a lot of players have changed. This contract expired on, before I was on this board. We've had three school board presidents, two superintendents, two solicitors, and even an additional labor negotiations firm. And there's one common denominator. Thank you, Katie. Ty, the question to you, what is your plan to move the negotiations for a new teacher contract forward? Well, first and foremost, I believe any plan to move us forward is going to have to be a united plan. When I say united, not just the school board, but the central administration, the SFT, we're going to have to get creative. We're going to have to sit down, be professionals, and work this out, find out where we can save money. Uh, there has to be um, some way we can come up with money because at the end of the day, we have to take care of the most important part of this district, which is the teachers. We cannot continue to employ and pay our talented teachers. We are going to end up having basically a skeleton of a district to the point where we're not even gonna be able to, like Daniel said, open the door. So whatever we're going to do as a district, we really do need to sit down and, and, and ask some tough questions. And I understand what they're saying about how we need to find money, but I will also go back to the statement I've made before. We need to go back to the state and say, where is your responsibility in, our, in this? Where, what responsibility do you take for this? Like, granted, I understand they'll say 90% of our financial woes are self-inflicted. I don't believe it to be that high. I believe it to be underfunding. We need to get that straight. And maybe that is another way that we can work our way out of this problem. Because if we do not find a way by paying these teachers what they are deserved, we're going to end up having a bunch of buildings empty with students standing around looking at one another. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. Sean, the question to you, what is your plan to move the negotiations for a new teacher contract forward? Yeah, I think, I think we do need to get creative. You know, we just started putting board members, uh, we have two board members in meeting, um, sit on negotiations. I think we need to start rotating board members in there so we can get a feel of what goes on in these discussions. Um, I, think it's, I think we need a temperature gauge too. How close are we to what, you know, how many teachers are close to agreeing to this? You know, if we can get a temperature gauge on how close we are to settling this, then we can see where we can move the needle and what direction that needs to be moved. You know, we're all here for the same reasons to, you know, to provide education for, for the children. So I think it's, the lines are drawn in the sand. I think we need to start coming together as a united front and have just conversations of, let's get this done. It's been five years and let's put, you know, let's, but like, let's just come together. It's a, it's a conversation at this point. And I, I really think if we take more of an approach like this, where it's not us versus them, and it's, we're all here for the kids. And we, again, let's take a temperature check to see where, we, how close are we to getting this done? And um, I, Ty has a great point. We have to start fighting for fair funding again. You know, when we're so shorted every year from the state, it makes a lot of things impossible for us to do. And if we get half of what we deserve, a lot of our troubles go away because that's an annual, you know, uh, revenue that we get every year. So there's a lot of things we can do, but coming together, working together and getting creative, I think is the best, the best, the best route. Thank you, Sean. Um, and now Tom, the same question to you, what is your plan to move the neg negotiations for a new teacher contract forward? So um, first of all, it's unconscionable that, that people who are master's level professionals who are entrusted with the care of our kids are getting shortchanged like this. Um, and I understand that there are a lot of moving parts and I do believe that a lot of us are on the same page. We want the best contract for our teachers. We want the best teachers to work in Scranton. In fact, when I got my teaching job years ago, um, I wanted to teach in Scranton. I wanted to come back to Westside where I went to school. And this was the, it was impossible to get in here. It had the best contract in the area. And now that's not the case. Now it has the worst. People are leaving in droves uh, and so, we have to think about something that's very important here. We've had three straight years of budget surpluses now. When I was on there, it was about 500,000. Uh, last year was about 3 million. And this year, I think you're looking at around 8 um, million. So the district financially is doing way better than it was in the past. The other thing is, you're looking at almost $60 million in stimulus money, which I understand can't go toward a contract, but it's a windfall that can be applied to other areas that can then free up money that you can put toward a contract. 
Like the thing is, the house is on fire right now. Um, you have over 100 teachers and paraprofessionals, and the number is actually closer to about 130 by now since the recovery plan started. They're just, everyone is bailing. People do not want to work here. And you know what? These are, think about the experience level that we have lost. When, what happens when a 10 year veteran teacher bails and we replace that teacher with somebody who doesn't even have a teaching certificate? I said, you know, you don't want somebody performing surgery on you if they're not an actual doctor. You know, so we don't, we don't want people. So, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll wrap up. Um, we, we want people in there who, who want to be a part of Scranton and uh, we have the money to do it. Thank you. The third question, uh, we'll start with Katie. And again, a little bit of a, a, a little uh, intro to the question. According to the Department of Education, receivership occurs, uh, quote, when school board, when school boards reject the chief recovery officer financial recovery plan, or if the school board does not comply with directives is issued by the chief recovery officer. If receivership occurs, all duties of the chief recovery officer and the school board transfer to the receiver with the exception uh, to the ability to levy taxes. Furthermore, the chief recovery officer could be appointed as the receiver. So the question is, as a school board director, would you be willing to ris risk receivership by rejecting any part of the recovery plan with which you disagree or by refusing to follow directives issued by the chief recovery officer as she oversees the implementation of the recovery plan? And please explain your answer. Katie, if you need me to repeat anything, let me know. <laughs> sure, no, I, 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 I often sing that song, so I, I know it well. Um, no, Jean, I would not risk receivership. I would do absolutely everything in my power to try to avoid that. With that being said, I have enjoyed a very strong working relationship with Dr. Finan, and I feel as though she has, we, we were lucky to have a recovery officer such as Dr. Finan, uh, someone who is so experienced and so well-respected, and I'd even go so far as to say well-loved, uh, who is truly devoted to public education. And, you know, I'm I'm sure there are things in that plan that she would rather not have put in there. But we have a we have a big task in front of us. And I think it's very important to stay on course and to work the steps of this plan, but to continue to be communicating with Dr. Finan. I, I do think she tries to to work with us to ease us into some of these most difficult decisions. And I, I just think that even though the financial picture is perhaps better than we thought it would be at this point, we cannot lose sight of the fact that we are still $300 million in debt. And this is not going to be a quick process. But I think if we work through these steps, it could be a five-year process, not a 20-year process. And that's what I'd like to see happen. Thank you, Katie. Ty, the same question to you. So as a school board director, would you be willing to risk receivership by either rejecting part of the recovery plan that you did not agree with or by refusing to follow directions issued by the chief recovery officer um, as she tries to implement, oversee the implementation of the recovery plan? And please explain your answer. Yes, first, I don't think any of us want to see receivership. I don't believe any of us by any means want to see that. What I do believe is that the Recovery plan can be amended. And at times when it's available, when we can, we should amend it. I've heard several times that the recovery plan can't be amended. And I'll point out that the state constitution has been amended 46 times. So if that document can be amended, so can this one. And what we are supposed to do as board members and representatives of the city of Scranton is to try to get creative and find ways to amend it so that it's in the best interest and helps us, the community, our students, our teachers, that's what we should always be doing. So someone might say we're questioning and going against. We're doing our job. That is our job. We are supposed to constantly, as school board directors, look for ways to put uh, the upper hand in our favor. Because let's make no mistake about it. I've said this before. What part does the state play in us being in this position right now? You underfunded this school district for well over 30 years. So you played a large part in putting us in what I call um, professional timeout, uh, that's not it. You have to do more than that. You have to come in and say, 
we are responsible. Here's, you know, you're not going to pay us all the money that we are due, but what about contributing something to us so that we can look to get ourselves above? Because raising taxes is not the answer. We're hurting the, the, the city more by doing that. We're taking programs away and raising taxes and we're driving people out. And again, we have to figure out a way to make it beneficial for us and also try and work with the state. It's all about work and communication and teamwork. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. Sean, the question to you, as a school board director, are you willing to risk receivership by rejecting any part of the recovery plan um, or by refusing to follow directives from the chief recovery officer? And please explain your answer. No, I, I'm, I'm not in favor of uh, receivership. Um, but when this recovery plan was made, we were in different different uh, financial uh, standards. There's, um, you know, yes, this money we received is a one-time lump sum of money, but it's just like a family. If they won the lottery, they're going to change the way they, they live. They're not going to spend it all, but they're going to look at their plan a little bit different. And I think we should just look at a certain things because we're in different standards now. We received money that we never expected we were going to get. And I think us, I think we need to be unite with the county and the city. And I think you're right. I think we need to start speaking up to the state. You know, we, we're allowing all these state officials when they run for governor and senator and, and everything to come to our hometown to ask for and beg for votes. But what do they do for us? You know, we just had a state official come here uh, over the weekend or last week, who's gonna run for governor. And you know, they're, they're coming here for votes. You know, we have the president coming on Wednesday who just got the streets named after him in the expressway, you know, coming to help, you know, probably elect a governor here. When do we finally stand up as a city and say, you know what, we need help. Everybody comes here and they say they're gonna help us and they want our votes, but until we finally say our doors are closed until you do something for us. And I think that's what we need to do because politicians don't like when uh, cities or you know, voters get vocal. And I think we all need to unite and go down to Harrisburg and say, we need our help, we need help. Because if we get that $30 million we're shorted a year, that $300 million go away, goes away pretty quick. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Tom, the question to you, um, are you willing to risk receivership um, or, um, and if not, please explain your answer. So, so of course I don't wanna risk receivership. And I also, I'm gonna say this, I don't think it's a risk and I'm gonna tell you why. Uh, first of all, currently the plan is amendable. It was sold as amendable, I was there. And also in the revenue section, I think it's section eight, it straight up uses the word amendable. So um, the plan can be changed and it should be. And it specifically cites revenue windfalls that are either recurring or one time, which we're dealing with. We're dealing with windfalls in, in budget surpluses and we're dealing with massive windfalls in stimulus money. So um, the other thing I'm gonna say about, uh, about this is we were told by the recovery officer not to advocate for fair funding. But you know what, when I was on the board in 2019, we did it anyway. And we ended up getting uh, uh, one-time infusions of cash from the state. We ended up getting uh, recurring uh, yearly subsidies increased. We were also told by the recovery officer that she was against the payroll tax, but we voted to bring it to referendum and it passed when I was on the board. And this board uh, didn't follow her recommendation. So, so the thing is, um, I didn't receive any threats about receivership when I was on the board because the, the plan is amendable. It can change, circumstances on the ground change. Everybody understands that. That's just how life works. Um, so, you know, I think we've also seen the plan routinely be ignored. How many administrative raises and positions were created that weren't in the plan? So the plan is not sacrosanct. It's not a holy document. It can change, and it absolutely should. Thank you, Tom. Danielle, the question to you. As a school board director, you, would you be willing to risk receivership by rejecting any part of the recovery plan with which you disagree? or by refusing to follow directives issued by the chief recovery officer as she oversees the implementation of the recovery plan. And please explain your answer. So no, I do not want to risk receivership. No one wants to see that. But the truth is, if you look at the district right now, it's almost like we're in receivership. We are closing buildings, we are losing teachers, 113 teachers, left the district over the last year. We don't have enough substitute teachers. Our buildings are crumbling. Um, we've eliminated uh, the learning support staff for students and so much more, just the, the preschool elimination programs are being cut. So we really need to look at this recovery plan and see what alternatives there are. The board majority, uh, 
they don't ask questions. They just basically take what the chief recovery officer says, they put their stamp of approval on it, and then that's it. So because of some of those decisions, we are seeing a lot of, you know, just a negative impact on the community. For example, with the closure of Bancroft, you know, the, the busing being reduced, there was a child that was lost on the first day of school. Now, as a parent, I look at that and no amount of money or debt is going to make me think that that was that's okay because it's not. So as a parent, I need to be asking questions about the health, safety, and the education of these students. And I'm not going to bl blindly follow. We need to look at alternatives. We need to really fight for that fair funding and just really advocate for our students because it's just not happening right now. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, so we'll move on to the fourth question and Ty, you will get to answer this question first. And we're gonna talk, give you an opportunity to talk a little bit more about the state. Uh, so please describe a law, legislation or executive order, for example, that you would advocate for the state legislature and or the governor to enact that would benefit the residents of the Scranton School District and particularly the children the, ser the district serves. Well, yes, it's real simple for me. It would just be asking the state to do what they're supposed to, which is fair funding. Um, there is a certain way that they they compute how much we're supposed to get. Live up to your obligation. We are all paying taxes. We are all um, doing our part. Now they need to live up to their part and just fair fund us. And again, it goes back to you have un we have been underfunded for well over 30 years. What about going back and creating something? Because I don't believe there is a law that exists that says we should get a one-time payment, cash infusion of this much that could eliminate some of the problems financially we are experiencing. So I think it's just holding people accountable to what they're supposed to do. I don't think you need to create or reinvent the wheel. I think we just need to hold them accountable and say, this is the, what you're supposed to do. This is the bare minimum that you are responsible to us and you're not living up to it. And therefore we are, our district, our teachers, our community is suffering. So. I always hear when people say when something goes wrong, let's let's recreate another law. You don't need to recreate anything. Just make people that are in these positions accountable. And you hold them accountable by being vocal and reminding them when elections come up. If you're not going to do your job, then we'll get somebody in there that will. But at the end of the day, you're required to give us this. And at the bare minimum of that, uh, it's owed to us. Follow up and do what you're supposed to do. And therefore, we won't have to waste time by recreating rules and laws and things, different things and going through all that. Just follow what's already there and do your job. Thank you, Ty. The question now to you, Sean, <clears throat> please describe a law you would advocate for the state legislature and or the governor to enact that would benefit the residents of the Scranton School District and particularly the children the district serves. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Ty. You know, fair funding that benefits our our, our our kids in, in learning and it, it helps our employees, our teachers get paid what they deserve. And it helps our taxpayers pay less taxes. It helps everybody. If we get what, you know, what other districts our size and our, and our income level get, everything it helps everything. It's a no brainer. And so many people come here and they tell us, hey, I'm, I wanna help you, we're gonna help you. And once they get into the positions to help us, they just don't. And I understand it's tough, trust me. Getting in this position is tough to do what you know you want to do, but it's time that we band together as a board, as a city, as a as a, a union. We all come together and we fight for what we deserve, and I think that fight, that change, would not only help our district, it would help every district in our state, and it would, it would just help everybody. So I think that's what we need to do, and uh, I'm looking forward to to starting the fight. So, thank you. Thank you, Sean. The question to you, Tom, please describe a law you would advocate for the state legislature and or governor to an act that would benefit the residents of the Scranton School District and particularly the children that the district serves. So um, I hate to sound like a broken record here, but I, I would advocate for a fair funding law. Um, when I was on the board in 2019, I, I was at the forefront of that fight, going to PTAs, neighborhoods, holding rallies, meetings, um, because that is the issue, as Ty said. The thing is, um, they passed a law for fair funding, but 
uh, a couple of years back, but they only allow new money to be put through the formula. Well, that doesn't fix, fix the, the mistakes of the past. And Scranton, when we, we there's three major subsidies, there's vocational, technical, special ed subsidies, and general subsidies. The general subsidies, we ran the numbers. We were, we were over 20 million per year, per year, short. You think Bancroft would have been closed if we were getting that 20 million a year? No, it'd look like the Taj Mahal. You know, we, we would be expanding our programs, adding music, adding the arts, adding STEM. We wouldn't be cutting. Teachers would have a contract. $20 million a year is an insane number. And that's how badly shorted Scranton is. We are the single worst funded urban school district in the state of Pennsylvania. And state leaders should be embarrassed. But you know what? They don't listen. And Sean made a great point. We need to put pressure on our leaders. You know, we're, we're the ones who have to pay the increased taxes. And we're still, you know, barely towing the line here. You know, it all goes back to fair funding. So I would absolutely advocate for that law. I would be in Harrisburg immediately. We were getting ready to, to get on a bus and go to Harrisburg to protest. And if I get back on the board, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to be on that bus. We're going to get fair funding. Thank you, Tom. Danielle, the question to you, please describe a law you would advocate for the state legislature and or the governor to enact that would benefit the residents of the Scranton School District and particularly the children the district serves. So I would have to agree with the other candidates. Um, we need to pick up the fight for fair funding because our district is so severely underfunded. We wouldn't be in this mess right now if we received adequate funding. We wouldn't have the teacher shortage. Our students would be having music and art classes on the library. So I think the fight has gone silent over the last few years and it really needs to pick up because we can't sit quietly any longer and just let this recovery plan take its course. We, we really need to be vocal about it. And like the other candidates mentioned, go to Harrisburg if we have to. I think just educating the public, I think so many people are, are not aware of how big of an impact fair funding has on the district. So if we really make an effort to educate everybody, anybody that we talk to, and just make it a citywide um, you know, thing where just everyone gets together and we go to Harrisburg, I think you know, just being a big voice with a lot of you know, people there, I think we could make an impact. And that way, this will help everybody in the district. It'll help the buildings. We could pay our teachers. The students are the ones that will greatly benefit from it. So. I don't know why anyone would not want to fight for fair funding at this point. Um, it's, it's long overdue. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. And Katie, the question to you, please describe a law that you would advocate for the state legislature and or the governor to enact that would benefit the residents of the Scranton School District and particularly the children that the district serves. Sure, thank you, Jean. Certainly the funding issue is, is one of the top challenges that we are facing, but I'm cautiously optimistic that the problem could get solved on November 12th when a long awaited court case finally gets its day and could really, really give everybody cover to do the right thing and fairly fund these districts. Certainly in this last year, we did see a bit of an increase in our special education and basic education funding, but also benefited from the Level Up program, which directed $100 million to the 100 most underfunded districts. And that that did give us a, a little bit more uh, wiggle room, I guess, to to put it in a silly way. But one of the uh, things that I, I do think we we need to make sure is on our radar is some of the work that's being done around charter school reform, particularly in the way it is funded. It is there's a, a lot of information coming forward through the Pennsylvania School Boards Association right now that is not an effort to dismantle charters or you know go after anybody's choice, but to hold them to the same standards and to um, put the same parameters around their spending that public school districts face and to to make sure that people are aware of where their tax dollars are going because you know we are certainly held to high standards as we should be in dealing with public dollars and the same should be said for charter schools as well. Thank you, Katie. The uh, next question, the fifth question, we'll start with Sean to answer. And the question um, 
is this. A recent newspaper article states that there is only one black male school teacher in the Scranton School District, even though the student body is quite diverse. What changes can the school board make in recruitment, hiring, and retention processes to increase the diversity of the district's employees? Yeah, and I, and I spoke with Mr. McLeod uh, after that article came out, and we had a great conversation. And um, we do need to have, you know, more teachers so our, that, you know, meet our students' population so they can look up to people. Um, and I think that we already started that process. I think we have a great tool that we hired, uh, we, we got for our HR department to help widen our range of candidate search. Um, we have our HR department got a program where it kind of helps our department put out the job applications to more than just Scranton and it takes it all, it takes it all over the place. And every principal I've talked to, everybody in the HR department um, I've talked to, love the program. So I, I think it's, we need to work as, you know, again, I always say it's working together. It's working with, you know, our, um, our community. It's working with our union. It's working with our administration and the board coming together to work on ways to, to, to do that. And I think we started the process, um, but I think we need to make sure we're committed to it and, and seeing it through. Thank you, Sean. The question to you, Tom, uh, a recent newspaper article states that there's only one black male school teacher uh, in the Scranton School District, even though the student body is quite diverse. What changes can the school board make in recruitment, hiring, and retention processes to increase the diversity of the district's employees? Yeah, so this is something that I've spoken to um, Ty about and uh, in his capacity as the, the uh, president of the local chapter of the NAACP. I've spoken to Mr. McLeod, who you're referencing in that article. Um, and you know, there, there's a lot that we can we can do, but there's an elephant in the room that we have to address. We can't hire teachers right now. Nobody wants to work here uh, because the contract is so absolutely awful. You know, people are leaving in droves. So if we want to diversify, which I think is extraordinarily important and absolutely necessary, we need to settle the contract. Um, and we need to be able to offer a competitive wage to people. Now, what we said in the primary, and, and I still stand by this, you know, we should we should be advertising in places um, uh, like Philadelphia, like New York City, like Washington, D.C., because we have a different standard of living here. You know, like people can move from bigger cities and have just as good a life here. And, and I understand that, you know, the, the cost of living is going to be lower in Scranton. That might be one way to increase diversity. But, you know, nobody's going to uproot their lives and move to Scranton for $38,000 a year for a master's level professional. Uh, you know, that, that, that's just not going to happen. So if we if we settle this contract, if we give a fair and equitable wage we can then bring in this kind of, of diversity. And I'll just say personally, I'm an English teacher and I don't have a great background in, um, in, in, in African-American literature, uh, Hispanic literature, and it's because I wasn't taught by anybody of that background. So we need to diversify so that our kids get a better education and a more diverse education. So I would absolutely uh, be in the forefront of that fight alongside Ty. Thank you. Thank you. Danielle, the question to you, what changes can the school board make in recruitment, hiring, and retention processes to increase the diversity of the district's employees? So right now, the, the lack of diversity in the district is disheartening. Um, I think as far as advertising goes, you know, using money to purchase software and other programs for recruitment purposes, we could spend, we could put so much money towards that, but at the end of the day, we really need to look at what is really having people leave the district. So I think people really talk and word gets out about our district and no one wants to work here. I mean, we can't even keep the teachers that we have. It's, it's really upsetting. So I think if we offer a competitive salary to our teachers and not offer them something, you know, similar to a health insurance, but not really a health insurance, I, I think that would really bring new teachers in. And I think people would want to live here in Scranton and also work for the district. district. Um, this will help really create diversity among teachers and school staff. Um, but I think we just, we need to put the, the teachers first and really look at why teachers are leaving and why we can't um, attract any. Um, if we make that the goal, I think we won't have an issue 
um, you know, hiring new teachers um, to really uh, add to the diversity in the district, which is severely lacking right now. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Katie, the question to you, what changes can a school board make in recruitment, hiring and retention processes to increase the diversity of the district's employees? Thank you, Jane. I certainly think we have made some strides in that vein in expanding our reach with job postings and, and the frontline software that's been referenced this evening. I certainly think continuing to communicate with colleges and universities, both in our surrounding area, but trying to expand that reach is very important. I, you know, I'm not under the impression that these programs are teeming with a diverse pool of individuals pursuing education as a career. So I think one of the things the district can do, and Mr. Borthwick makes a good point about the curriculum that's available and, and trying to come up with other ways to inspire the students who are in front of us today to pursue education. One of our teachers brought a program, I, I believe it's called Teach Plus, one of the initiatives under that umbrella, a wonderful program about identifying students in the classrooms and reaching out to them, inspiring them. I think there was a, a letter writing campaign or something involved with it, but you know, identifying students that seem to, seem to be a good fit for the teaching profession and really encouraging them and inspiring them and making sure that they have the tools and resources they need. And I, you know, I think that's something that can be done in the classroom. It can be done through our guidance departments. And, you know, there are also probably community resources to make sure that students have the, the financial means to pursue those degrees as well. Thank you, Katie. And Ty, the question to you, what changes can the school board make in recruitment, hiring and retention processes to increase the diversity of the district's employees? Well, first and foremost, good news travels fast, bad news travels faster. We have to take care of what we currently have. I mean, you cannot begin to recruit until you number one, first and foremost, solve that problem. Second of all, as a person of color and being on this campaign trail for the last nine months, I have repeatedly heard from people, wait, you know, wow, there's a person of color running. Um, just to put a point of reference, you know there has never been an African-American elected to a position in Scranton's history. Um, Scranton has a reputation from people that live outside here as a town that is not culturally diverse at all. I know this because people constantly say it to me when I talk to them, when I go places to events, or I speak at different groups. I, I deal with a lot of minority groups, um, being part and being president of the NAACP. Um, part of my job is getting mixed in and mingled with the community traveling around to different places in the county and, and meeting people and hearing what they have to say. And, and I, I'm trying my best to tell them Scranton is diverse, it's changing. What I believe will change that is changing our board. Um, you know, you have to set a presence, lead by example. I don't want people to vote for me because, well, I'm a person of color, let's put him on the board. No one wants to be an affirmative action appointee. And that's not what anybody wants. Vote for someone of color because they are a person that's qualified and can do the job. But in doing so, it will also send a message to people that you are serious about change. You are serious about being more adaptive and being more um, acceptable to the current community and climate that currently exists in our, in our, our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. I'm wrestling if we have time for a, a sixth question here. What I'd like to do is ask a sixth question, but um, everybody will just have one minute instead of a minute and a half um, to answer the question, and that'll still give us the time for the closing statements. So um, hopefully our timekeeper can handle that. Um, we can. So the, the question is, and this one um, Tom will answer first. Do you support the school district moving from a business privilege mercantile tax to a payroll tax? Why or why not? Okay, so um, this issue was something I dealt with when I was on the board in 2019. I don't believe it's the right move now. And the reason I say that is because the, the way that you determine um, the, the effective tax rate when you make the switch is based on previous year's collection. So the pandemic has negatively impacted collection. Uh, and so we would not be able to get uh, a, we wouldn't be making the, the kinds of, of revenue that we would need to make in order for this to make sense. So uh, I'm not necessarily against it going forward. 
but because the pandemic has so uh, negatively impacted revenue, I think there should be a pause on it because I don't want to see the district. And I think the, the figure was like something like they might be shorted $1.8 million if they switch. I don't think the district should be risking the loss of $1.8 million a year at this current juncture. So I'm not necessarily opposed to it in the future, but right now, because of the way the pandemic has impacted revenue, I think that the district should put this on pause. Thank you, Tom. Danielle, the question to you, do you support the school district moving from a business privilege mercantile tax to a payroll tax? Why or why not? So to be honest, I don't think I can actually answer that because I would want to actually ask the public how they feel about this. Who will this impact? I've heard a little bit about local businesses that would take a severe hit um, if it is moved um, to that type of tax. But for me, um, you know, I, I would need public input before I could even, you know, voice my opinion about this. I need to really learn how this would impact our city because if, if we don't have a city and businesses are moving out, we really need to look at what we're doing. I think it should be left to the voters to really decide how we should proceed with this. Um, you know, that might not be the answer that people want to hear, but I just, I need that community input before I could effectively make a decision on this. So, thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Katie, the question to you, do you support the school district moving to the business, uh, from the business uh, privilege, sorry, mercantile tax to a payroll tax, why or why not? That's okay. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> now, I do, I do support it uh, for several reasons. Uh, first and foremost, we did have a referendum. I think it was two years, maybe three now, where voters did overwhelmingly support that the school board consider the conversion. And I, I take that as, we don't hate this idea. Please look at the pros and cons, explore it. That certainly makes me feel that people are a bit more in support of it than not. It is a more collectible tax. It is something that is more, uh, it can be balanced against the EIT numbers. There are checks and balances that exist in this tax. And certainly there are businesses that will be negatively impacted, but we've worked very hard to make sure that we are understanding those concerns, that we are dealing in the reality of them. And also I think it is important to point out that the $1.8 million is not an annual loss. It is a revenue delay because of the way the quarters are collected. We will not collect the first quarter, the first, first year that we implement this tax. But there is, of course, the possibility of this growing and replacing that $1.8 million delay, but it is not lost revenue forever. Thank you, Katie. Ty, the question to you, do you support the school district moving from the business privilege mercantile tax to a payroll tax, why or why not? I'm aware that it will benefit businesses, owners, manufacturers, if both the city of Scranton and the SSD uh, switch together so that the additional burden isn't placed on our businesses who have chosen to stay here for two years while trying to pay two separate taxes um, to, both to both entities. The SSD is currently working on a plan to delay um, the revenue for approximately 1.8 million from my understanding, um, with solutions are recouping these funds at a later date. As a board member, I will strive to speak to our local business owners and understand their concerns with both the taxes and make decisions that will benefit both the SSD and our community business owners. Thank you, Ty. And Sean, the question to you, do you support the school district moving from the business privilege mercantile tax to a payroll tax, why or why not? Yeah, I don't mind the overall tax, but the timing of it. Um, the city's on a shot clock. They need to do it by the end of the year. We can do whenever we want. I feel like we're being rushed. I know the, the mayor made a comment in the paper that you know they're patiently waiting for us. We've been waiting for answers from them for five years. We have had multiple mayors that are working on this, three business administrators, and just up until a few months ago, we've had questions to them that have not been answered. Um, so I don't, I know it's a delay of collecting um, the 1.8, but from our business minister, he told us it might take 30 years to make up that 1.8. And I don't like to take chances, especially when we're just starting to save money and we're starting to have some positive um, things happen to the district. And our chief recovery officer is against us. And that's who we're supposed to listen to with the recovery plan and everything like that. So 
right now, I, I don't hate the plan. I just don't like the timing of it. So right now, I would caution not to do it right now. Thank you. Um, and so now I'd like to turn to the closing statements. And so earlier we do a drawing and uh, it was determined that Ty Holmes will give the first closing statement and then again, we will rotate. Uh, and so Ty, uh, here's the time for your closing statement, thanks. Well, first and foremost, I wanna say thank you very much for having me here and to all the candidates, I wish you all the best of luck. Um, what I wanna to say to the people is first and foremost, vote. Um, Voting is your power. Voting is your voice. We, voting is almost like uh, you're grading your elected officials by saying you are doing a good job by reelecting them. When people fail to vote, um, it, it just boggles my mind because people have died to give us the right. Um, for women, you didn't have the right to vote until 1920. For African Americans, we didn't have the right until 1965. So not that long ago, <laughs> people could not vote. People are still alive that did not have the right to vote. So I ask people, no matter which candidate you are supporting, please go out and vote. It, it is your um, right, it is your privilege, it is honor, but it's your duty. And on November 2nd, I ask you to vote for me because I am going to work. Um, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to look at all the information provided, I'm going to ask questions, and I'm going to make decisions that are in the best interest of our city, our school district, not just right now, not just tomorrow, but five and 10 years down the line, because I believe we as a district have to forward think. We cannot make decisions based off of what's in the best interest now and say, well, in 10 years, I'm not gonna be here, so it's not gonna be my best. We cannot lead that way. Um, that's not how I led in my profession and I will not do it this way. I will work hard, I will ask questions, I will educate myself before making decisions that are going to financially and educationally affect this city. And again, on November 2nd, I ask that you please get out and vote and I would, respectfully request your support. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. Sean, your closing statement. Yeah, I'd like to thank you and the League of Women Voters again for the time. And to all the uh, board members who are returning in November and to you know whoever is voted on November uh, 2nd, whoever the eight members are, we're gonna have a great board either way. And we are all in it for the same reasons. And we wanna make sure this district is improving and getting back to where we used to be. You know, I'm so I'm so sick of hearing people leaving our city to go to Clark Summit or Taylor or anywhere else because of the school district. You know, we need to make Scranton the place where everybody wants to work. Everybody wants to send their kid for a great education. And that's why we're all here. Um, I hope the time I've been on the board, I was able to demonstrate that I care about my district in my city. You know, I've been there to listen to our students' concerns, our parents' concerns. You know, I've been um, a, a strong vocal um, leader. I've been in, you know, I, I visit our schools frequently. Um, I'm in the classrooms. I'm, I'm, you know, investigating what's going on. I, every email I get, you know, I follow up, hey, can I have a, you know, can we have a phone call to discuss this? I, I, I hate when I hear this position is a stepping stone because it really isn't. If you look at this, the problems we have, you look at the size of the budget we have, this is a, a big task. You know, this is a 24 seven gig here. And um, there's a lot of, there's a lot that goes into it. And I hope I've proven enough that, you know, you appreciate the work I've done and that you would support me on November 2nd because, you know, um, I promise you, I won't let you down. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Um, Tom, your closing statement. I'd like to begin by saying once again, thank you very much for, for hosting this. This is great for voters uh, to, to get a sense of their candidates. And I, I, I would respectfully ask for, for anybody who's, who's watching to please consider voting for me on November 2nd. Here, here's the thing. Um, I'm a lifelong Scranton resident and I'm, I'm, I've got two kids who are going to go to Scranton schools. And all of the uh, decisions that the board has been making affect my kids, which means it's affecting your kids. And even if you don't have children or grandchildren in the district, this is our, this is our community. This is our neighborhood. You know, we, we live here and we need to have a top notch educational system because Scranton is on the upswing. You know, pe developers can't build apartments fast enough. People want to live here. And if they're going to want to live here, they're going to want to raise families here. And as Sean said, people are, you know, you hear people abandoning uh, Scranton for, for the Abingtons or for Taylor or Domer or whatever. Scranton used to be the place to, to, to get an education. And if you elect me, 
I'm going to work um, like crazy to make sure that Scranton becomes that once again. And there are so many wonderful things that this district has done in the past and can do again. You know, I, I know it's a nuanced example, but you know, the Scranton School District put a violin in my hands when I was in fourth grade. And I don't know if you can see, I've got guitars on the wall back there because I'm still a musician because of the Scranton School District. The Scranton School District gave me opportunities that I can't get in private schools or charter schools. And so we wanna be able to have a district that says, hey, listen, we're gonna do better for your family and your kid than anybody else in Northeast PA. And so that's what I would fight for if I get on there. I'm fighting for the future. Uh, please consider me on November 2nd. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Danielle, your closing statement. Thank you. So once again, I would like to thank the League of Women Voters for having all of us here tonight and also wish the other candidates the best of luck um, in this election. So if there's one thing that I would like to convey to voters, it's that I'm not a politician. I'm a parent. I am doing this because I felt like I've been voiceless, voiceless the last several years that all of my concerns have been not heard by the current board. So as a product of the district, I cannot sit back any longer and watch the destruction of the district that I love. Um, I want better for my son and every student in the district. I want him to have teachers um, as he you know progresses in you know in school. So, you know, the, the health, the health, safety, and well-being of every student is a concern of mine. And I think just from talking to the public, I have a really good relationship with voters and just listening. And I, I think that's so important that when someone sends an email or when somebody gets up to speak at a meeting, that that we listen. We don't disregard what they say. And I want to be that board member. I want to be that board member that that wants the best for the district and works together with other board members to accomplish that too. But most importantly, we take everything into consideration. How is this, this decision gonna affect the students? How will this affect the teachers? Um, so going forward, I would be honored to have your vote on November 2nd because I, I promise, you know, I, I learned so much over the last 11 months and I plan to just keep learning um, just to be the most effective um, board director that I can be. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. And Katie, your closing statement. Thank you, Jean, and again to the League of Women Voters, and thank you to all of the candidates for participating this evening. I have enjoyed this work tremendously. It has been eye-opening, it has been inspiring, it has been exhausting but I would very much like to continue doing it because I don't, I don't want to talk about what Scranton used to be or what it can be. A friend of mine, uh, the mother of a friend of mine gave me some very good advice when we were in college. She said, don't fall in love with somebody's potential. And I want to, I'm in love with what Scranton is today. It's a challenging place. It's a confounding place but it is full of children who are having the only experience they are gonna have in third grade or fifth grade or in their senior year. And we need to do everything we can to make it the very, very best. We have to deal in the reality of our current circumstances, certainly. And I know that they are not always ideal, but I don't wanna to spend too much time on the doom and gloom of all of this. I wanna spend time focusing on the accomplishments of our students. I wanna talk about our new STEM Academy that is developing right now. And I wanna solve our problems ourselves, which we are capable, more than capable of doing. And I wanna make sure that we are working together to fight the very real war on public education that exists in this country and across this state. It's very, very serious. And the people who are trying to dismantle public education are playing a very, very long game. And they can't keep us busy fighting amongst ourselves, focusing on the negative while they run away with the store. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Lackawanna County and the Center for Ethics and Excellence in Public Service at the University of Scranton, I wanna thank the candidates who were here this evening, Tom Borthwick, Danielle Chesek, Katie Gilmartin, Tyrone Holmes, and Sean McAndrew 
for joining us and speaking to the voters about their vision and plans for the Scranton School District. Uh, we also thank you for watching this program, educating yourself before Election Day so you can make an educated choice. And of course, be sure to vote in the November 2nd general election for your municipal, county, state judicial, and school board candidates. Thank you and have a good evening.